All right, good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Stan Collins. I'm a suicide prevention specialist, and um, I'm going to be just kind of helping to steer this conversation a little bit. Um, I'm going to allow each of the panelists, many of whom, or all of them, whom you know, uh, probably except for me. So, uh, to give you a little background on the work um, that I do and why I was invited to be in this panel is uh, I lost a friend to suicide when I was 14 years old and I've spent my entire adult life working in suicide prevention. I work on a program called Directing Change which invites youth and young adults to create films about mental health. I work with LA, uh, Department of, uh, LA County Department of Mental Health on some of their suicide prevention stuff. But I think the, one of the reasons I was asked to be part of this and one of the reasons I'm excited to be part of this is that you know, through our conversations, we're gonna talk about loss, we're gonna talk about experiences, lived experience with attempts, with thoughts of suicide. And I think for a long time, for me, one of the things that's always frustrated me is that we've always mystified suicide. We've always felt that the power to prevent suicide is in the hands of these very special Ouija people that if we can just identify who it is and we pass them to somebody and pass them to somebody and pass them to somebody that eventually there will be this magic leprechaun that knows how to cure suicide. And that doesn't exist. Suicide, and it's not about preventing suicide, it's about helping someone find their reasons to live. And so um, what I hope that we'll do today through our shared experiences with you all is that we'll be able to help you find some inspiration, maybe help you find some skills and help you really embrace the role that you can have in helping someone find their reasons for living. Because I have a saying that goes, when you speak the name of the beast, it will retreat. Only by talking about suicide, suicide prevention, only by talking about it in forums like this can we ever hope to, to change the conversation. So with that, we're gonna kinda go down the line. Miguel, I'll start with you, or do you want me to not put you on the spot? We can go this way, you're good? Um, so if you could just uh, introduce yourself, speak a little bit about why you wanted to be here, why you wanted to be a part of this, and we'll just kinda, from there, we're just gonna talk, um, and we'll take it from there. So Miguel. Great, uh, hi guys, my name is Miguel. I'm um, Dad. <laughs> Born and raised here in Los Angeles. Um, I've, I've, I'm here because uh, I have a, I've, I've had a little bit of experience with depression myself. Um, I also have had friends who have dealt with depression in their own ways, uh, and I've also had loss because of um, uh, because of, as, as the result of some of the self-medicating tendencies that can can be a coping mechanism for um, you know mental mental challenge or challenges uh, emotional challenges I don't even know what to call it yeah but you know um, with people's mental struggles mental health struggles so that's why I'm here yeah and Tori I'll turn it over to you yeah hi my name is Tori Shack um, I'm the executive director and founder of Tangible Movement. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation that was formed to help inspire and educate and bring awareness to youth and young adults who are struggling with um, mental illness, addiction, and suicidal ideation. Um, and I myself am a two-time attempted suicide survivor. Um, I struggle with depression and addiction my entire life. I'm currently sober, eight years sober now. Miguel here is actually my lead ambassador for Tangible Movement. So a round of applause. And we just hope to bring awareness and education around uh, the subjects. I think it's very, very important. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm Christopher Roundtree. I'm the artistic director and conductor of an experimental chamber orchestra in Los Angeles uh, called Wild Up. We just had our 10th birthday. Um, I'm also, thanks. Um, I'm also um, in residence this year with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, where I curated their festival called Fluxus. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here today, um, I, I, I talk about so many topics about futurism and about music and about creativity, um, but I, I so rarely talk about suicide. And um, when, when I was 20, I lost my father to suicide. And um, when I was 27, I lost my partner to suicide. Um, and I remember calling my therapist at that moment and kind of saying like, I just had a, a second primary relationship and in suicide I thought maybe I should start therapy. And she said, this is a good reason. So I've been in therapy for a decade. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, really happy to be part of this conversation. And the great, the wonderful, the most handsome man in suicide prevention, Kevin Hines. I think, I think before I introduce you to myself, um, <laughs> I think what we need to do right now, I think is something very important, and is start this off with all of you. Let us, let us take a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost to death by suicide from lethal emotional pain. In my short 37 years on this gorgeous planet, I've lost eight people I love to this pain, not the least of which was my biological mother, Marcia Veronica Silvera Prasad, may she rest in peace, and not the last of which was a man I called a brother named Jeremy Richmond, who was one of the, arguably the greatest brain health activists and violence prevention activists this world has ever known. And he died just a few short weeks ago. And uh, I think let us take this moment of silence before I, before I tell you who I am to consider that tonight is about hope. Tonight is about holding immeasurable gratitude for the very little time we had with them. And tonight let us choose to honor their memories, hold them right here, never forget them, and think about celebrating their lives on their birthday, the day they were brought into this beautiful world without that pain. I celebrate the lives of the eight I lost with family and friends that love them just as much as I do, because the only way to properly grieve a suicide is together, without blame, and with no guilt. Right here, right now, let us all take a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost this way. And may they all rest in peace. Um, my name is Kevin Hines, and in the year 2000, at 19, merely a child, I attempted to take my life in a way that is 99% fatal. In the waters of the Golden Gate Bridge, I resurfaced, and a sea lion kept me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. So I am blessed to be near you all and in front of all of you, and we are blessed and thankful to We Rise for having this very crucial conversation for change. Yeah. First, on that note, I want to acknowledge it's, it's great to be in a room full of energy and honestly, I look out at the crowd, I see smiling faces and we see love and hope in this room and who would have thought that that was the case when we're here to talk about, you know, not just suicide, but suicide prevention. We're talking about here to talk, talk about hope and healing. Um, so with that, I don't know, I mean, where do we want to start? I was, I was going to say, I was going to go one direction, but I kind of want to throw it all to you. Like if you, like what brought you here tonight when you were invited and you were asked, what is it that made you think that, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I wanna be a part of this conversation about suicide and suicide prevention. Honestly, because it's not, we are not the, the, you know, it's not the funnest conversation. It's not the sexiest conversation. It ruins all sorts of dinner conversations. <laughs> but at the same time, it also makes for some of the best conversations, the most important ones. So what made you wanna be a part of this one? Just to be honest with you, I, I think there's a tremendous need to normalize conversation about mental health in general. Um, it's the reason why it was important for me when I understood the mission for Tangible Movement. Uh, it jumped out as something that needed I needed to be a part of. And that was just because I've experienced in my own way, you know, bouts of depression, and it, it wasn't a normal conversation to have with my family members. Um, for numerous reasons, be it cultural or religious, or just the way that we we look at mental health and the conversation of mental health in society, I guess. Um, and it's apparent to me that we won't be able to elevate as a species um, to really 
understand ourselves and to be compassionate and show compassion to others until we are able to let go of some of the negative mental habits. And all of that ties into um, what I believe is, is a part of considering something like suicide. So um, just really being able to offer my voice um, to have an open conversation with people and make it as normal as possible, I think that's why I'm here. That's exactly why I'm here. Yeah, well, uh, I think that, you know, towards the end right there, you said something about normal, and that's, I don't know, I, I think in 2019, we're kind of figuring out what does this word normal mean? Because it's weird, because it's not, on some level, it's not that it's normal to think about suicide, but at the same time, it's not abnormal to think about suicide. So what is that? Like, what is that word? How do we fit in the middle of that? And you were talking about the cultural piece. Um, so can you speak to that for a second? Because uh, a lot of times people um, in, other, in other cultures, and I know this is you know weird coming from a middle-aged white dude, but like um, a lot of times we'll say you know that's not a problem on our culture, or that's not a that's a white problem. That's a so how did you how did you embrace that? How did you deal with that? When I realized the difference between my consciousness and my brain. I started to realize who I really, I was able to separate myself from my thoughts. And I thought, wow, no one ever really, I didn't really have that uh, around. You know, there was no one to, to help say, hey, by the way, like some of the things that you think have to do with the way you were raised and things that you just take on because of people like your parents and your family members and your culture, uh, society, um, your community, the way that you are portrayed in the public eye in terms of people who look like you. Um, and all of that feeds into the way that you see yourself. Um, but it doesn't mean that is who you are. And when I realized that, I realized there's a lot of other people like me who just needed to look at things from that, you know, just if you're able to make that separation, it can make the difference in how you treat yourself and how you see the world, so, yeah. That's beautiful. Um, so going back to the, the kind of beginning, what, um, like, Chris, this is in your normal world to hear, you're, you're in the music, you're in orchestral, like, what made you want to step forward into this space and have a conversation? Yeah, um, well, first of all, it's pretty scary. Like, this is a, this, um, I get in the middle of the stage. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, uh, the, you know, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is I, I experienced, um, these losses in in, um, in my life um, to suicide in such totally different ways, and the way that um, my father's death affected me, and the way that my partner's death affected me about seven years later, um, was so totally different. And um, I so the the week before my father passed away, he um, he handed me like a big note. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just like he had scribbled a bunch of things to me. But in fact, like he had written me like a treatise. Like this is how you could go and do your life. And I didn't get what it was. And part of that was like, hey, I think you should be a teacher, but you and probably you should go be a conductor. Like I think you should go be an artist. Um, which like that's a lot of like heavy drama to give somebody. Um, but but he gave me this thing, and I remember being offended by some things in it. And I like he was like, how will you know when you found your lover, like your true love? And I was like, I have a girlfriend already. Um, and I remember being really offended. We had a big fight about it, actually. Um, and then a week later, he was gone. And uh, and I was like, oh, this was you trying to send me into the future um, in a way. I mean, I didn't really get it till a year later. But like he was trying to be like, I, I don't know what to give you. I'm in pain, but I'm going to give you this. And then I got to go. Um, and I remember getting it a year later and being like, oh, I have this incredible opportunity and like, I have this amazing kind of choice ahead of me, like what to make my life about. And I remember my, my worldview like totally changing from being like very kind of like, you know, um, like Orange County school kid who's just in college for two years to someone who's like, oh, how do I go across the earth and like spread joy to people through music? And I, re I remember it kind of just the feeling of kind of immensity. Um, so that was the that was my father's passing, and then my partner's uh, a number of years later. I just started this organization, Wild Up, which is now turning ten. So I guess this was ten years ago, and we had our first concert, um, and then um, and. 
and then she died by suicide and I, and I got a note in the mail from her um, and it was like it, it was like the biggest tragedy ever and it didn't feel hopeful it felt like an ending and I didn't do anything for a year like I remember I started this organization and we were on NPR and we were like in the LA Times and it was great and then like two weeks later I was like oh I'm not going to do anything for a year I'm just going to like unplug from the whole world and and that was fine. That was like, oh, this, that was appropriate at that, at that moment. And I had to like, it took me a while and a lot of therapy to like realize that it was okay, that, that these were so totally different, but um, that whatever way we deal with grief is like, that's the okay way to deal with it. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm saying that in too broad of terms, but I feel like we all, we all deal, we deal with gr grief in different ways, you know? Um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. Well, I think that's something that makes me, so I, I've lost, um, unfortunately I have one friend that kind of brought me into this world and I've lost other people since then, which is ironic because I, I kind of thought once I got involved in suicide prevention, I wouldn't lose anyone again. Like I would just be immune to it naively. Um, but I look back at the loss of my friend and my own experiences with thoughts of suicide. And of course I would give anything to have him back or to have them back or, you know, on some level never had to feel that pain. But I'm wondering, especially for, for you, Kevin and Tori, or anybody, I mean, all of you, like, is there a part of you that's almost grateful for that experience? Like, is there a part of you that, because it's such a defining part of who we are, like, is there, is it just me, or is there sometimes, is there a part of you that's like, I'm not ashamed of that because that is what made me? Does that, am I making sense with that? Like, is there a part of you that is, like, part of me is grateful that I had that pain so that it gave me perspective. And again, I, not that I wouldn't change anything to have my friend back, but it, on some level, he defined me. I wouldn't be doing this, I wouldn't be sitting on the stage. So, does that make sense? Is there ever gratitude for you guys mixed in this? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, as far as the pain that I've gone through in my entire life with depression and struggling with it, like, if I could give it, a, give it back and not have had to experience that, then I would definitely probably choose that route. Um, I mean, I battled with depression since I was 14. And to go back to your earlier question, which I think is really important while we're all here, um, the stigma was so real for me growing up in Orange County. Um, my father, when I was first diagnosed um, bipolar when I was 14, my, my father said, no, 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 no. There's no pe crazy people in my family. You are not bipolar and you're not going to therapy. My mom s would sneak us to therapy, pay cash. My dad didn't want a paper trail, so he would not allow us to use insurance to go to, tr to, go to therapy or the doctor. So I was like the black sheep of the family, you know? And um, which eventually for that, you know, that reason, a lot of others, I, um, you know, attempted suicide, but I had suicidal ideations. Um, like I have 20 times a day, like just kill yourself, kill yourself, just jump off that, or just, just, just drive your car into the, uh, the thing, or just, Take that knife or take, you have gun, just, just do it. You know, you're a loser, you know? The way my brain would talk to myself. So grateful um, for my experiences. I would say I'm grateful that I, uh, I'm alive and that I have the opportunity to share my experience, strength, and hope with others and the fact that I wish that somebody, when I was 14 and 15 years old, were, was up on a stage like this, sharing with me. So that's kind of the gratitude, I guess that, that's more, to answer your question, the gratitude that I have is to uh, make a difference and be impactful, yeah. To kind of lay your jacket down to, uh, so someone else may avoid the puddle or something to kind of help change somebody else's track. That makes right. sense. Right. So I'm the weird one. Um, but yeah, I mean, but, or maybe just appreciative for the strength that's given me. Maybe that's a, a better way to look at it. I, I think that that we, as human beings, in any culture around the world, we can allow our pain to defeat us, or we can let it build us. And I, I've always chosen to allow it to build me. Now, uh, in, I was in the greatest lethal emotional pain of my life when I did what I did, uh, and at the millisecond that my hands left the rail, it was an instant regret for my actions instantaneous regret and a prayer to live. And in the survival, 
uh, it wasn't just like I turned around and started doing this work to try to help people. I was in a hospital in a psych ward, my first of, of what would be eight in my lifetime so far, psych ward stage for suicidal ideation. And a Franciscan friar comes in and he always would read the chart. And when he comes in, doesn't read the chart, and he goes, hey kid, what are you in for? And I'm wearing a back brace and I'm holding my cane from back in the day. And, and I go, brother, I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he said, oh yeah? And I'm the Pope. He didn't believe me. <laughs> he thought I was delusional because I was in a psych ward. And I said, no, brother, that's what happened. That's why the back brace, that's why the cane. And he said, kid, when you get better, you ought to talk about this. I looked at him, I said, about what to who? And I didn't know what he meant. And every day he'd come in, every day he'd pray with me. And at the end of the, at the last of his, my day there, he came in and he goes, son, I expect you to talk about this. And I was like, sure, pal. And, and then I, I got out of the hospital and my father took me to the church we were growing to as a kid. And I, the priest comes out at the end of it and says, Kevin, how would you like to come and talk to our seventh and eighth grade class about your experience this Good Friday? It was seven months after my attempt. My wounds weren't healed. I was still walking with a cane and a back brace. I said, Father, I don't have a speech and I wouldn't know what to say. And that's when my dad, who's six one and I'm not, shoved me forward and said, he'll do it. <laughs> I looked back like, what are you doing, old man? He goes, you'll do it, we need closure. I said, you need closure, I need to go home and lay down. <laughs> and then he said, you'll do it again. When Pat Hines says you'll do it twice, you do it. And so I went there and I went on Good Friday and I talked, talked to seven, eight grade kids, 120 of them. And, and I thought, who is this going to help? I read a speech from the page, 17 pages, you know, 45 minutes to read aloud. I dropped the last page to the floor, eight hands went up. And two weeks later, I got 120 letters in the mail from 120 kids. I'm no fool, they were mandated to write those letters. <laughs> 127 eighth grade kids and they go, let's all write to the suicidal guy simultaneously. No. But in, in those letters, because they were not given parameters on what they could write, and they were minors, they wrote to their heart's content. And six of them were actively suicidal, we got them to safety, and they are alive today. And so if we can all be a part of that change, if we can all be a part of that change, brings up another curiosity for me, and I hope this one's not, I'm not on the outside on this one, but I know probably a lot of you are here because you want to be helpers, you are helpers, it's in your nature to be helpers. So how do you, how do you continue to live your own truth and still seek help? You know, uh, about 15 weeks ago, I was in my eighth psych ward stay. I had gone from 2011 with, until 15 weeks ago with no psych ward stays. And the first thing I did was post on social media the truth. Because if I'm not going to tell you the truth about my pain as I'm trying to help you survive yours, then I'm doing no one any service. I'm lying through my teeth and I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna tell the truth every time. I, I found therapy last year. I'm sorry, a year and a half ago. Two years ago, wow. <laughs> Two years ago. Um, it's actually what, what, what helped me um, and my wife get married. It, it took therapy, and it was through therapy that I realized how important it was to have that and use the resources that are there. Um, so I do think that it is, it is like, like you said, it's so important when, you know, you walk, you walk what you're talking, especially when it's something like this, because it's such a private thing, you know? It's such a, pain is such, such a private thing, and it's really, complex and there's so many walls that you put up to hide it to cope with it and um so i think it's important to always be on the level of like we are and we're in it together and I, I love that you said that that's one of my it's just so important that people understand that really it's a human thing all of all of it this is it's a human experience and with life it's gonna have it's gonna oscillate and it's not always easy to help balance that out. So I think getting on a level of um, we're on the same page or we're doing the same thing is important. So yeah, I, I, I also am a, um, I see a therapist regularly um, and it's been super helpful, man. It's been an important, 
in my transition to seeing what is and what is not important in this experience, in this iteration of life. So, yeah. Well, yeah, please. Well, I think, you know, what I heard from that was pain, uh, that pain is so private, but at the same time, like, that pain is universal. Like, regardless of what is bringing that individual pain into each of our lives, like, we all know that, and let's, let's experience that together. Um, but Troy, I know you've been an advocate for a long time, and so I wanted to get your take on the um, speaking your own truth. And I can tell you that the advocacy has really put a damper on my dating life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> swiping on Bumble, they're like, oh yeah, okay, we're chit-chatting, and they go to my website or my Instagram as, like, mental health advocate, and it's all this. point in my life compared to where I have been, um, I have it together a lot, I mean, way, way beyond where I used to have, like I was telling Miguel the other day, um, I couldn't open my mail. I had trash bags filled with mail. I couldn't get off the couch, I couldn't wash the dish, I was afraid of the mail. And I had taxes I hadn't filed for five years, six years, um, I was, and then I was homeless living out of my car with my dog. Again, not really great for the dating game. Um, so, um, there are still areas in my life that I, you know, I, I work on. I go in and out of therapy. I don't see a therapist like 24 seven. I, I look at it this way. You know, if you have a closet and you put start stuff in that closet, like, okay, you just close the door and all this junk's in there. And then all of a sudden you try to open that closet up and the closet just explodes and it comes, all the stuff comes pouring out. So when I go, I go to therapy to clean my closet out. Um, and once the closet's clean and I'm sitting there looking at my therapist like, what are we talking about today, you know? Like, how are you doing? What's going on with you? Um, then, I <laughs> uh, then I'm like, okay, all right, we're good. We're solid for right now. But um, I, I think that my life today is probably the best that it's ever been um, as far as, yeah, thank you. Me and my dog Rufus. And uh, Did you say Rufus? Him. Yeah, Rufus is his That's name. That's my mom's dog's name. Really? Rufus. There you go. It's a good great name. Great dog name to start up. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, it does. Um, I don't know. You have any questions for each other? I don't want to be the only ones going. Is one of you? Is one of you talking, thinking of a question for someone else? I, think. I have a question for Miguel. Of all of your albums and songs and their reach. Which one that, that you wrote touched you, helped you the most? Great question. Uh, Take your there's time. a couple. No, there's there's a couple. I, I love that question. Um, there's a song called "What's Normal Anyway" um, that was really helpful because I think in writing it I was able to see <laughs> how retarded this idea of normal is. Um, and then in being able to perform it, it was probably one of the songs that connected really deeply with my fans. And I felt a different kind of closeness, you know, with my audience. And it really was encouraging to talk about, you know, things that, it's just some of the negative th things that we, we think are like normalcy, like what, really, what is normal? Normal is defined by so many, that there's no such thing. It's really not, it's, it's an un, unrealistic ideal. Um, and so that's one, that's, a, that's, that's one song I would absolutely say was super therapeutic. And to this day, is, is I feel the most uh, in touch when I look at someone and I'm singing that song. You know, I feel like I'm connected. I, I, feel, I feel very connected with people when I sing that song, so yeah. Thank you, that's awesome. Thanks, man. So one thing that, that unites us in our own unique ways is uh, how art and how we're all here tonight. Art and the connection between art and mental health and how it brings it all together. So um, with you, each of yours artistic, and, and Kevin's a filmmaker, uh, came out with a film uh, last year, right? Ripple Effect. Um, 
How has art been something that you have kind of tethered yourself to this earth with? Most people who, 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 who know my personal story about my attempt don't know uh, much that happened before it. And I actually had an attempt prior to the Golden Gate incident and I was in my room and I had on repeat uh, an album I just bought by DMX, Earl Simmons, Dark Man X, and I, I was in the middle of, of attempting to take my life. And this song comes on and DMX says, Lord, I'm in so much pain, please take me away. And then you hear God's voice that says, no, I put you here to do a job and your work ain't done. To live is to suffer, but you're still my son. And there will be a time when you shine as bright as the stars, but there won't be a his or hers, just ours. And I, I stopped exactly what I was doing. I pressed repeat on that singular song. I got to a safe place and I listened to it every day for the next month. The sad part though is I never told anybody what I did and nobody would find out until my second attempt where I nearly died. And that song in that moment absolutely saved my life. That's uh, it's dark and hell is hot, right? Um, go back, check that one out. It's a good album. Um, so how, how else? How has art helped you, saved you, tethered you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say for me, um, like uh, conducting is such a strange thing. Um, it's like there are a hundred um, Olympic athletes that are stand in front of you, and they're all kind of in there. Like most of them are between 40 and 60. I'm 36. I've been doing this for a decade or so. Um, so like they're all older than you, basically, and they all have an incredible um, expertise in their instrument. And somehow there's this alchemy where like you move your body, and then they all do the same thing at the same time while like trying to do it perfectly, and then also judging you. And, and and then, you know, and, and an orchestra is like an emotional like uh, organism, and you can feel the morale in the orchestra changing, not just the tempo, like at an orchestra and at any given time, the basses could be in a tempo, and then the drum set in the back, and then the first violins are all in a different tempo, but they're like kind of the same tempo. So there's this thing where you're trying to like physically pull energies together, and their emotional energies, and their musical energies, and their kind of um, physical, like physics energies. And um, I remember this feeling one time where, um, I don't know if this speaks to that, 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 that like, um, I feel emboldened by a loss. I don't know what the right, there's no really, I felt like I was conducting and metabolizing loss while it was happening, like while I was making the work, and what the, the will that was coming out of me to like hold all of our tempi together, and to like hold myself up like, I'm not an idiot, like even though they're all judging me for sure. Um, uh, like that came from a place of turning loss into something positive, and I didn't tell them about it, you know. But I knew that that kind of dark energy I could like spool together and like hold it, and then it would hold us together and make something better than what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and that felt awesome, and I feel like that there's something about that in this work where I can like physically metabolize grief. Um, and also, I have to say, I'm like pretty, I'm, I'm you know, I'm like situationally depressive. Um, uh, and and I, I go through a lot of bouts of like self-confidence problems and a lot of um, just like being kind of down and about the state of the world too. I've been depressed for a couple years. But I feel like when I'm, when I'm making music, I don't think about that at all. I'm like just doing the thing. But w then I stop and I like take my tuxedo off in the room or whatever, and I'm like there, you know? And sometimes I could like bask in that it worked. But usually it's like only in the act of making music am I, am I like metabolizing grief. And in all other times, it's like something that I sit there with and kind of look at, you know? Um, so art is so helpful, if, if only as like a respite and some like little metabolism. Of well, I love, I love that phrase though, metabolizing loss, metabolizing grief. Like, you got, you got another opportunity in writing or poetry or something. Oh, that when you, you know. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm glad it's not totally incoherent. <laughs> um, I don't know, either you want to speak to art and, you know, it's saving grace. 
I metabolize music, I guess. I don't conduct or play or perform. I tried right around the time of my first attempt, I was 14 or 15, I really was into Metallica, and I wanted to play the, the bass guitar, so my friend had a bass guitar, he was teaching me how to play the bass. And so I went home and told my dad, like, I want to play the bass guitar. He's like, no. Nope. It's not feminine enough for you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Little does he know. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he didn't know at the time, but I was like, okay. Um, so he got me the keys. He, he, he got me the keyboard and he wanted me to play the keys because he thought that was appropriate for Orange County girl, you know? And um, I, I just like flipped it over. I'm like, no. I'm not, I'm not, and I wish I'd learned how to play the keys, but I didn't. So, um, yes. So I appreciate music from musicians, um, and I'm gonna age myself a little bit here, but like my favorite band of all time, I probably listened to the album like well over a thousand, two thousand times probably, is Fleetwood Mac. So if I, could, if I could meet Stevie Nicks, I'd be like, yes, Stevie, yes. what art does for me as far as music. And when I was younger, um, in high school, I was really angry and I got into a lot of fights, a lot of fights. Um, I was actually kicked out of school for punching the dean in the face. Um, I had a little bit of anger issue, um, but I got back in. <laughs> I know, I got back in. This is how I got back in, it's through art, actually. And this is where this is going. I, I used to write poetry, it was really dark. But when I went before the board, to get back in my senior year of high school, I said, I have channeled my anger through poetry now. <laughs> and they believed me. <laughs> <laughs> and they let me in. And then I wasn't, and that did something else stupid and I wasn't able to actually walk on my graduation. But, so there have been periods of art throughout my life that have helped me, but mostly music. So yeah, to answer your question. <laughs> so that makes me think of something. So I was sitting around, hanging out with my buddies a couple weeks ago. And um, when I was my, going through my deepest depression, it was like senior year of high school and a freshman year of college. And uh, I was also angry. That's how I, even though I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty mellow, pretty even keel. Um, and me and my buddies were talking and uh, one of my friends said, he's like, you know what? I've never been in a fight. And uh, I'm not condoning fighting by any means, but I was just shocked that a grown man had never like been in a, like even a pushing match. Like he just never had any experience with that. And then my, my other friend, and then he, his response was, well, man, in high school and college, you were always getting in a fight. And then out of left field, my friend says to me, he says, well, yeah, it's because he was super depressed. And I was like, dude, where were you when I was, if you knew at the time that I was depressed and I was fighting, why didn't you pull me aside and say, hey, Stan, like, What's going on, dude? And so I guess my question, I bring that up to kind of set the stage for the question of what tips do you have for those here in attendance or what tips have you gained in your life that help you like, you know, when we say we like, we have our phone in our hands, oh, you know what, I should text that person or I should call that person or that person said that and I should call them on it or I should check in. Like, how do we get over that hump? Cause that's like so many people are waiting to be tapped into. Like what tips do you have? I'd like to use a, a personal experience to answer that question. All I needed on September 25th of the year 2000, on the bus, in the very back row, in the middle seat looking out upon 100 people, was for one human being to see me, see my pain, and say something kind. Are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you? Or a variation of the three, would have allowed me to divulge my pain that I couldn't speak on without being spoken to first. All that would, uh, that would have saved me that day was for a human being sitting next to me on that bus to care enough to look at me and say something kind. And I think that's a lesson we can all take with us is that it doesn't have to be the suicide prevention specialist or the person that's at worked in the field for 20 years. Sometimes it just needs to be that you're human, so are they, and it is our moral duty when we see someone in obvious pain to say and do something. Well, with that, I think you bring up a good point, though, 
is we get so worried about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing that we end up not saying anything or not doing anything. And I think you bring up a powerful point. Sometimes it's just creating the space. You know, when I lost my friend to suicide, I, I kept thinking about like, what didn't I do that day? Why didn't I talk to him that day? Why didn't I do this? And I realized like, no, we got to create that space all the time. People ask me, when is the best time to ask someone if they're thinking about suicide? Or when, it, when is the best time to have a conversation about suicide? And I say, when you're not at all worried that the person is having thoughts of suicide. So they know that if they ever do want to have a conversation about suicide, we've already, I've already, we've already set the table. It's not a big deal. Let's sit down. If we need to talk about suicide, let's talk about suicide. I just want to speak to that for a second and just the power of the question. A lot of us get scared of the word, the S word, the word suicide, and we're afraid to ask somebody, are you thinking about suicide? And what we all, what we've learned is that that's the best thing you can do is to, to do the heavy lifting for the individual. So like you were saying, all they have to do is say yes or no or, or break down and cry. Um, how do you create that space with those in your lives so that it doesn't have to be the big deal? Like I remember when I was a kid, um, I, my, my mom had this really nice crystal bowl that she kept M&Ms in. I don't know why, it's like a beautiful bowl, but she kept M&Ms in it. And I broke it one day. And so as kids do, what did I do? I hid the evidence, right? So I took all the pieces, put it in a trash bag, and I hid it in my closet. And I said to myself, okay, at just the right moment, I will tell my mom about this crystal bowl that I broke. And then that, it didn't happen that day. So the next day I'm like, okay, today at just the right moment, I will tell my mom about the crystal bowl. And then after, you know, that right moment never came. And then a couple weeks later, my mom's cleaning out my closet, finds the pieces of the crystal bowl and went downhill from there. So how do we create space in our lives for our friends and our family so that any moment is just the right moment? I think um, one of the most important feelings to have is to felt listened to or heard. That's one of the most valuable things. From personal experience, I always feel the most, uh, just having, when you know how that feels, then I think for the people that you love, you, you, you want to ask those questions. Are you okay? Can I help? Um, and I think it's, I think it's probably more of an exercise of just caring for the people that you love and um, just trying to be there for them. And it is, it really is as simple as often just asking. Um, like my wife will be like, um, I'm just glad that you asked me how was your day? Do you know? Because sometimes we assume a lot. And when, we, when you're around people that uh, you're familiar with, Sometimes you just assume it's all good, you know? It's like everything's good, you know? And just a simple asking, for me, just to be asked and listened to has, has been super valuable. Uh, uh, with that, we'll go down and we'll put you on the spot. And we'll kind of work just closing remarks, whatever you want to leave people with this evening. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you. More than anything. Thank you. And thank you guys, because this is as much of a learning experience for me. And, and I think it's important that we're always educating each other. You really start to see, you know, the possibilities of being vulnerable and how important it is to be vulnerable. So thank you guys for allowing us to be vulnerable up here and for listening and giving your time to consider the things that, you know, are being, we're talking about, man. Right? It's, it's important on so many levels, not even just for us here in this room, but for generations of people to come. And the more that we can educate each other and in dealing with these problems, the more we can educate each other and the next generation so that uh, we can cope with these things and deal with these things in a way that's productive. And, and helping each other. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything super wise to say other than, um, you know, just be kind. You never know what somebody's going through and how what you say and do can have an effect, positive or negative. Again, I think the, the biggest driving home factor I, I like to convey is it's okay to ask somebody, are you okay? You know? um, and it's okay to ask somebody, are you, you seem to be, you know, you're giving away your possessions. 
Are you suicidal? Are you feeling suicidal? And um, the most important thing, I think, ask how you can be of service to them. You know, don't just assume, and like you said, the cliches, you know? Nobody wants to hear a lecture uh, at all. At least I didn't. Um, just have an open ear, be kind, reach out, and definitely know the resources, like the suicide hotline for sure. Um, I think that would be the best thing that I can give as a takeaway is just be open-minded and um, ask your fellow man how they're doing. That's it. Different cultures have diff these different experiences around suicide. And I, I heard years ago about um, when essentially like the drug companies exported their product to Japan. Um, and the Japanese concept of, of uh, melancholy. And that melancholy didn't exist in the lowest spot in someone's life. Melancholy existed in, in before the export of, of like uh, prescription drugs to, to, to that culture. Um, existed, melancholy was the state closest to God, and that it was very dangerous because you might merge with the divine. And for me, I was like, oh, like, and you should really you should, like demystify, and and um, to me that like remystifies this this thing. And perhaps it's in the wrong direction, but it made it complex in a way that I could like try to deal with it differently. And I'm not sure, you know, in sharing that as the last thing, I'm not sure that's a good last thing to share, but 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 but, but, but it's something of like to look at it and be like, oh, we all have a different view on, on this. And and if we can look at it and make it this so complex, such a complex thing that, that we can't even comprehend, um, that that suddenly it makes it more more real and certainly more authentic and in the room. Um, and then because I, I uh, don't talk about this very often, but I never really realized, I never say the names of my, um, my family who, who um, died in suicide. David Brent Roundtree was my father, and he's a really loving guy. Um, and Kathleen Marie Henderson um, was my lover for a bunch of years. So, I You should do this more because you you have a, a charm and a grace about you. So we welcome you in this space, man. I will share a stage with you anytime, Dana. Thank you. Do me a favor. Yeah. Take your phones out one more time. <laughs> and I want you to type in text C N Q R. Text CNQR to 741-741. That's the crisis text line, and that's our foundation's conquer keyword. It stands for courage to talk about your mental health, normalize the conversation, ask the question, are you suicidal, and do you have a plan and recovery? Because we are all living proof. And finally, if you are physically capable in this room right now, please stand with me. Get your phones back out, because you're not going to want to miss this with your cameras. Ladies and gentlemen, my new friends, we are going to yell at the tops of our lungs like their lives depend on it. Be here tomorrow like their lives depend on it. We need gentlemen, my new family, our new family, be here tomorrow, and every single day after that, you are important, you are worthy, you matter to all of us, and you will never die by your hands, you are perfect just as you are, and if nobody else says it today, we love you, and we want you to stay. Thanks for everybody. Bye.